Bello step. Bello step. Amen. Good morning to you. How are you today? I'm so glad you are here. I am excited. This is a, a special day. One of our one of our associate pastors today will be sharing the uh, word. I'm excited about that. Then our brother Derek. So I look forward to that. Our then a, a senior pastor. Well, he's out of town. Then heading home right at this time. So we need to uh, lift them up in prayer. Uh, let me share just a couple things with you. Like if uh, this is your first time and if you have not completed one of these cards, please if I can have you at this time to fill it out and you can turn it in like at the, the end of the service. Let's see, out in our foyer and we have a, a gift uh, for you. Also, Wednesday nights is a special time in the uh, uh, life of our church. We then come together at the uh, five thirty. We then eat. We have a, then a study time, a discussion time. We have a then a time of prayer, and we would love to then have you to come. And there's always a lot of food. Amen to that. I'll say that. Okay. Hey, if I can have you like at this time, just to uh, go ahead and uh, stand. And if I can have you to uh, day. Uh, this uh, morning, I felt then uh, led to do then uh, some, something a, a little bit different. So, if you can hold your hands out in front of you, let's see, as a cup. This is today our th 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 a prayer. So, I'm going to say it. I'm probably going to stutter, but I'm going. You don't have to then uh, stutter, but you can say it after me, okay? Lord, I am ready to receive what you have for me. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Sometimes you gotta dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you gotta stare down the giant, worship from the lion's den. You gotta shout it from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that he's gonna get you there. Sometimes you gotta welcome the wonder, wait for the answer, worship with your hands in the air. I'll praise you anywhere. Doors swing wide. Sometimes you gotta stand on the shackles, brave in the battle, worship with your hands held high. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give me praise, give me praise in the highest praise. Give me praise, give me praise in the highest. Anywhere every promise came 
goodness every step, each and every breath. I praise you anywhere, faithful all my life. Blessings day and night, countless reasons why. I'll praise you anywhere, every promise kept. Goodness every step, each and every breath. I'll praise you anywhere, praise. Give me praise, give me praise in the highest praise. and Lord of Lords and he is right here today and his spirit is roaming this room scripture says that man uh, looks at the outside but God looks at the heart and I pray that your heart is you know, one within him today the good thing if it isn't you're in the right place and actually actually, before you even leave here today you can come to know him as Lord and Savior isn't that exciting it's, it is right now the uh, the Let's see our offering time. So let's pray. God, we thank you for every good and perfect gift we have today. We know it comes from you. And Father, we thank you for the privilege that we get to give back just a small part of what we have from you. Thank you for that. Father, I ask you right at this time that you will take every uh, tithe and every offering, multiply it, and use it all for your glory. Bless each and every person today who is able to give. Father, I just thank you for the many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated, please. Once they have, let's see, receive your offering, if I could have you to stand up as we worship. Thank you. Lord, 
some technical difficulties up here this morning. We're going to get it straightened out. Is your mic good? Yes. I'm sorry when I've 
come with my agenda I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough take me back to where we start I open up my heart to you The Kingdom Kids can be dismissed now, uh, ages 5 through 10. Whoa. I guess I have a different voice. So, obviously, if you came here expecting to see and hear Pastor Ben, you're going to be disappointed this morning. Uh, I'm not Pastor Ben. So, um, sounds like I'm in a little bit of an echo up here. So, uh, good morning. I don't know what's happened with our uh, sound system this morning, but we've... I don't think it's gotten any better. I think the more I talk, the worse it gets. Everyone hear me okay, though. So, um, Pastor Ben started a new series last week, um, and we're going to continue on uh, this week. I'm going to read a few verses of Scripture, but I'm, you can remain seated. I've got, um, we're going to kind of break this down just a little bit today. Um, we're talking about your response when temptation strikes, and um, I think, I think actually Pastor Ben and Dana, and they're all on their way home right now, so they said they're listening online, and they're, they're with us in, by way of screen or, or uh, internet, but not with us in person today, but uh, we wish them safe travels home. Uh, so I'm going to be reading from James chapter 1, uh, beginning at the 14th verse. It says, but in, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It should be on the screen for you. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, 
gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And I love that. He says, of his own will, he brought us forth. It was his will that he brought us forth out of here. So uh, for a few minutes today, I'm going to be speaking about the, uh, your response when temptation strikes. So as many of you know, I've shared this story a couple weeks ago in Sunday school. So if you heard it a couple weeks ago, I'm sorry. Uh, but it, it kind of goes along with the message. But we, several years ago, Joni and I were, um, she, you know, we have four kids. So we just kept having kids and we ran out of room in our house. So it, she decided that it was time to have a bigger house. And I just, you know, usually after much uh, going back and forth, maybe arguing, jo- usually Joan, I usually give in. She usually gets what, uh, that's why we have the fourth one. Uh, I, I give Emery a hard time. She was the fourth one. But I said, if she was born first, I wouldn't have had a second one. Because she's, she's a handful. But I love all four of them. But we had, we just kept growing. And so we decided, she decided, we decided that we needed a bigger house. And uh, so we sold the house. And in the meantime, um, we, we, I didn't want, she didn't want to buy something used and, and fix it up again. Because we had already done that. We had already, the other house I had, we had remodeled everything from top to bottom. And just had already been there, done that. We wanted to build something new that was ready to move into. And I didn't have to paint anything. I wouldn't have to do anything. So in the meantime, between selling the house and building the new one, um, we had needed a place to stay. So we had this, the church I was going to, we had this uh, garage that had an apartment on the back side of it. It's where we kept traveling ministers in and stuff. And so uh, it hadn't been stayed in in about a decade. So this place needed a lot of work. It was not ready to be moved into. So we worked out a deal with the church that I was going to remodel the apartment. And in lieu of, so I was going to remodel the apartment. Whenever we got done building the house, they would have a functional place to keep ministers in again whenever they traveled. So it worked out great. So um, also the pastor lived pretty far away. So on nights that we would have service, he would he would stay the night. And in his office, he had another um, couch that made a bed. So we had church on Sunday nights. And this one particular Sunday night, um, we were all I was church was over. I went home, went to bed. My pastor was up in the church, and he had went to bed. And I was almost asleep. I was laying in bed, and I get a phone call, and it's my pastor. And I was just kind of groggy, just kind of almost asleep. And I said, hello. And his response was, bring a gun. Someone's trying to break in the church. And like, and I'm like, okay. So I don't know any other men in the room today that I, I've envisioned what it would actually look like whenever I'm in a situation where I had to use a gun. Like, in my mind, if I ever had to use a gun, I'm like, in my mind, I'm already in like camo and military, I'm a G.I. Joe, like ready to go. Um, and this time I'm in my pajamas. So like, it, it didn't at all look like what I thought if I ever had to use a gun, what it was going to look like. So I'm running up to the church because the building was like a ha- about a hundred yards away from the church. And I'm like, I, my mind was focused and I was like, I was honed in like this, somebody's trying to break in this church. So we and I didn't know that he had already messaged a couple of the security guys um, to come as well. And they were armed to the T. So as I'm approaching the church, I can see them coming from both directions. I'm like, I'm in my pajamas with a gun. And someone's going to shoot me thinking I'm trying to break in the church. So I called him like, hey, it's me. Don't shoot. I'm out here. So we, it, funny thing, we walked through the church. And we, you know, no, no, no one was trying to break in. And what happened, it actually, after church, these two little old ladies decided they wanted to go eat dinner. And they rode together. And when they came back, she was just doing her due diligence and was shaking the door, making sure it was locked. And he thought someone was breaking in. So at all the chaos, um, you know, I'm out there in my pajamas with a gun. I'm like, everyone's, it was a bunch of chaos. But then it, it made us, there was a beauty to our strategy in the fact that I know that if anything ever actually does go down in five minutes, it's, we're going to be there. We, we have got a strategy. And the more I think about that, I'm like, that's really, why can't we, as, as Christians, treat out temptations that we go through and struggles? And why can't we hone in on that and have the same focus and mentality that I've got this struggle, I've got this situation that's in my life, I'm going to attack it, and it's going to be gone. But we don't do that a lot of times. Some of us struggle with this, and we, we have this, we, we, we just kind of let it in and pet it and let it have its way in our lives sometimes. So we, we, we need to have the same strategy that ain't no old lady going to break in our church. You know, we're going we're gonna to keep that down. So that's, 
that we're talking about our strategy today. So point number one is that the pursuit of intimacy with God happens in the context of adversity. The pursuit of intimacy with God happens in the context of adversity. It's a struggle sometimes to live for God. Anyone find it easy all the time to live for God? Sometimes it's a struggle to be on fire for God 100% of the time and doing everything we know we're supposed to be doing. Sometimes just as simple as reading the Bible is difficult sometimes to... I mean, I remember whenever I was a teenager growing up, we would have, they would do the read the Bible through in a year. And I'm like, all right, this year, I've got it this year. I'm going to do it. And I don't know how many more times. I've read Genesis way more than I've read Revelation. It's like, I, I'm like, third weekend of January, you're like, man... And November comes, like, all right, January's coming. I'm going to do it. And then by February, I'm, so I, I've got Genesis memorized. And I, so Revelations was a lot less read than Genesis was. But, and we have nowadays, I've got four kids. I've got all responsibilities. And it's hard to, there's always something that needs to be done and competing thoughts. And even something as easy as reading the Bible sometimes, it's hard to be successful in getting that all in all the time. And so, so I think sometimes we live in Romans chapter 7 where, where Paul said, I, I want to do good, but the things that I want to do, I'm not doing. And the, thing, the evil things I would never do, those are the kind of things that I'm doing. And I, he said, oh, wretched man that I am. I, I don't know why that I am so, I, I do the things I don't want to do. I'm not doing the things I know I need to do. What a wretched man that I am. And so we get discouraged by those situations that we're in. We get discouraged. It's, it's discouraging whenever you know that you should be living a better life for God, that you should be living closer to God, that God's not as close to you as you feel like he should be. It's, it, it can get discouraging. Uh, there's a guy um, that I work with that he's, he t- was telling me just the other day, he said that he was addicted to everything known to man. He was addicted to hard drugs, alcohol. He was addicted to all this bad stuff. And he was going to church and he, he began praying in church. And he said he felt it in a church service that it literally he felt like something fell off of him. And he knew exactly what it was. God broke that addiction in a moment. And he's never had that, that desire to have the drugs or the alcohol ever again. It's never, he said he knew what it was. And he called his wife. He said, well, you can come get me now. I'm, I'm done. God healed me and it's, it's over. And God does that. And that's, that's awesome that God does that for some people. But some people, and maybe you're here today, that God hasn't broken addictions. And God hasn't broken the desire for those temptations um, like he did this, this guy at work. Sometimes it's, it's hard to not give in to temptation. Sometimes it's, it's not the easiest thing to just put it aside and pretend like it's not there. So we need a strategy. We need a strategy. I want to look more like a SWAT team in G.I. Joe's and camo than a guy in his pajamas whenever I'm going to handle the next event. I, that's what I want it to look like. So we need a strategy. I remember growing up from age 13 on, I was, uh, they had a youth event. We, we would do it every other year. It's called North American Youth Congress, and we would go... And I, I don't, I went as a young person, every one of them until I became the youth leader in my early 20s and I went to every one of them. So I don't think, I missed one in like 20 years. And every time it was always the same. You'd be there for like three days and you'd get on fire for God, like the preaching and the, and the worship. You would just feel like you're on just the, the, the steps of heaven and you're just so close to God. And we all would come back and then as soon as we would come back on like a Saturday and my, my pastor would have us get up on Sunday night and testify about what, what we uh, experienced at Youth Congress. And I remember like every time we're all like, I'm, I'm never going to sin again. I'm, I'm going to be on fire for God. I'm going to win my, my kids at, at school. And we would all, and then two weeks later, there wasn't a one of us that was as on fire as we was whenever we had come back from Youth Congress. It's just what happens. We get surrounded by the same problems and struggles uh, before we got there. And so we have to look at the situation that we're in and that we're dealing with because every one of us deals with a different temptation. What tempts you may not tempt me. And so we have to look at our situation and talk about our strategy. And so number two, if life is a struggle, which it is, if life is a struggle, how do we struggle well? If life is going to be a struggle, how do I do it very, very, very well? And so our situation sometimes feels like a war, because really it is a war. It feels like we're constantly at war with, with doing good and, and, and staying away from evil because it is. It is a war. It is a spiritual war that we're in. The pursuit of intimacy with God happens in the context of adversity. Jesus Christ, as much as in Scripture he's presented as this lamb and this shepherd, he's also presented as a warrior. 
Jesus is presented as a warrior. His arrival was a landed invasion. 1 John chapter 3 and 8 says, The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. To destroy the works of the devil. In his first introduction in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve had sinned and they committed the sin against God and they broke their faith with God, God announced the solution to the sin problem was going to be a savior. And he said, and the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Will crush that of the serpent. Jesus was a warrior. And in the first introduction was, was warfare. I'll destroy the one who has deceived you. Not just a landed invasion, but now it's also a rescue operation. Jesus arrived and announced by his father, this is my son and who I am well pleased. He gets up, he's baptized, he goes into the wilderness and he's tempted for 40 days and 40 nights and he beats the temptation. He comes out and, and, and he comes out from being tempted and preaches his first sermon in Isaiah 61 says, the spirit of the, of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord anointed me to proclaim release to captives and freedom to prisoners. Jesus said, I've come to set people free. I've come to set people free. That's why he came here. He is the redeemer. He's, he releases freedom for prisoners and, and captives. That's what he came to do was to set people free. Jesus was performing miracles in Luke chapter 11. And the onlookers are trying to catch him up because he's, he's performing miracles. And they don't like, so they try to trap him up. Where, where do you get this authority? Who do you think you are? Who's given you the authority to kind of do this stuff? And who are you? And G, this was Jesus, what he said. This, he said, picture a strong man with armor that no one wants to mess with. And someone comes along stronger than him and beats him up and takes his stuff. That's basically what Jesus said. Luke chapter 11. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all of his armor on which he relied and distributes his plunder. Jesus said, that's who I am. You picture the strongest man you know, and I'm stronger than him, and I'm going to come and take his things. That's Jesus claiming to be. He is the warrior. And some of us are caught up in temptations that are, that are stronger than us. But the good news of the gospel is that the stronger one is here. The stronger one is here. And so he's here to destroy what you cannot and set you free. I, I, you, can, you can do the, the best you can know how to do, and you will never be successful at, at living for God without the help of God. We, we're human, we're flesh and, and bones. We, until we have all spiritual bodies, we have flesh that we're going to deal with every day. And so he's here to uh, destroy what we cannot and to set us free. And he did not do it by being violent. He wasn't, he did come to be a warrior, but he did not do it by being violent. The Bible says that he took it upon himself. Jesus never was addicted to a drug, but on the cross, Jesus became a drug addict. Jesus never was addicted to alcohol, but on the cross, he became an addict. He didn't just die for the sin. He actually became the sin. He became that, that feeling. So the Bible says that whenever he he. He became that sin. So what, you can think of the worst thing that you've done. And Christ felt that on the cross. I was watching this thing the other day. And he was, this medical doctor was kind of describing what was happening on the cross and what Jesus was experiencing. And the Bible says that that soldier had taken the uh, spear and they pierced his side. And blood and water flowed out. And he was talking about what that water was, was actually some sort of a fluid. And I'm, I'm definitely no medical doctor, so if, if you are and I butcher this, I'm sorry. But he was saying this, literally what happened was, is that his heart was broken. It literally, he felt the weight of the sin of everything that this world had, everything, every sin ever committed. He's felt the weight of that. He felt the drug addiction and the alcohol. He felt all the murder and the, and the adultery and the, everything that you can imagine that's bad in the world. He felt that as if he had committed the sin. And it literally broke his heart. And he, that's what he died from, was literally dying from a broken heart. Second Corinthians chapter 5 says that he who knew no sin, he became sin for us. Colossians 1 and 13 said that he took our sin and death and we get his life. He transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom. So not only was it a landed invasion and a rescue operation, it is now an ongoing mission. C.S. Lewis said this he said enemy occupied territory that is what this world is christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed you might say landed in disguise and is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage and so we're in a war spiritually 
but one in which our king has already won. So we, we look at it and we think, oh my word, I'm fighting this, I'm dealing with this, I can't get the, the victory over this. And Jesus has already won the victory. Because Jesus won the victory over addiction, we can win the victory over addiction. Because Jesus won the victory of, of being addicted to pornography or whatever it may be, or you've got struggle with gossip, whatever, it may, whatever thing that you're dealing with, Jesus already won the battle. Because he became that sin and he beat it, now through Jesus, we can be uh, victorious over whatever we're dealing with in life because Jesus already won that battle. He's already defeated it. Because he beat sin, now I can beat sin. It's like the, the Philistines in the Old Testament uh, the Bible talked about how when Goli- um, Goliath was up there and no one wanted to mess with him. He was, Israel was shaking in their boots. They were, they were completely powerless because this mighty man was, was too big for them. And then David steps up and kills the giant. And at that point, Israel began to get, they began to get their power back. Though we can do this. And they ran the Philistines out of Israel. And because the son of David... Jesus Christ has already won the victory. Now we can have the war cry to run out. I'm not just saying, because Jesus has died on the cross and and won the victory, we have victory over whatever it is that we think that we're dealing with that we can't get over. Jesus Christ has already won that, that victory. He's already won it. And we just have to get into this place where we understand that God's got the victory and it's not up to me. And with the Lord's help, we can get past whatever temptations that you have in life. People often think that when they come to the Lord and they get saved and they start living for God that um, never going to have any temptations or problems or struggles ever. And that's not the case. I mean, I'm, I can tell you that's not the case. I've been at church since I was a baby and I, don't, I can tell you that's not the case. That people think that maybe this Christian life doesn't work because I'm still struggling with stuff. So you think about whenever Jesus, they, they told Jesus, uh, Lazarus is dying and we know that you're a healer. We know that you can heal Lazarus. If you will just come, lay your hands on Lazarus, he can be healed. So they knew Lazarus as, they knew Jesus as a healer. They, they wanted the healer to come. And what Jesus wanted to show them was that I actually am more than a healer. And I want to expand your, your understanding of what I'm able to do. So I'm going to take too long. I'm going to let Lazarus die so that I can prove to you that I'm a resurrector. I want to expand your knowledge of who, what I'm really capable of. So I'm going to have to let you go through some stuff, Lazarus. You're going to have to die. You're going to have to suffer some things. Lazarus was a good man. It didn't mean that he didn't have to struggle. God let him die, literally die, so that he could reveal himself as, as, a, as a, a, a raiser of the dead. They didn't know him as that yet. And so you haven't been freed from the fight. You've been freed for the fight. So now whenever God brings you out of a situation and you still struggle with it, but you, you've, you've won the victory over it and someone knows that they used to see you uh, strung out on drugs or they used to see you um, and on alcohol and they, they knew that you didn't have any sort of victory in your life and they see you successful now, well, if God did it for him, he can do it for me. So you've not been freed from the fight. You've been freed for the fight. So it's not, it's not that just because I'm going to start serving God that God's going to take away all my problems. No, sometimes God's going to let you go through some stuff so that he can reveal to other people that are watching you what he's able to do. So you, you were a victim and now you are a victor in Jesus' name. So for those of us who are in Christ, the spiritual life is now one movement with two parts. It's a movement away from ways that, that hinder us being in a, in a uh, relationship with God. And it's a movement toward intimacy with God. It's a movement away from things that, that prevent the intimacy with the Lord. And it's a movement toward the Lord, away and towards. Um, theologians would have uh, words for this. Number one would be sanctification. To, to, be, to sanctify is to be set apart from common use and set apart toward worship to God. There was, there was utensils that would be used in the temple that was only to be used for worship. It was, a, it was to be set apart from common usage to something else. That's sanctification. And then there's mortification. And those, whenever you, when God sanctifies you, and he, he, he washes you, cleans you up, and he, you're, you're covered by his blood. There are things that we have to mortify. Whenever I become sanctified by God... There's certain things that I, places I'm not going to go anymore. There's going to be certain things I don't do and say anymore. There's going to be maybe some groups of people that I don't hang out with anymore. That's mortification. That's mortifying things that I know hinder me from my walk with God. And lastly, there's vivification. 
And that's, that's where you clean up all the weeds and you plant flowers around them. That's cultivating the ground. And you'll notice the order. It's sanctification, mortification, and vivification. That's the order. It's not, a lot of people want to take that sanctification, move it to the bottom of the list and say, well, if you'll clean your life up and you'll start getting, looking the part, then maybe God will sanctify you. And that's not the gospel. The Bible says that you're sanctified. And because you're sanctified, we, we, we mortify our flesh and we, we cultivate the ground around us and we start changing the, their outward things that, that look like the world and we start separating ourselves from the world to God. So it's sanctify, mortify, and, and vivify. And if you put your faith in Jesus, the Bible says that he'll never forsake you, never leave you, Hebrews chapter 13. But sometimes we can be, God, Jesus can be right there beside us and we can feel like we're a million miles apart if we don't cultivate that relationship with God. That part is... It's not enough just to get sanctified. We've got to mortify the flesh and we've got to cultivate the a, a, a atmosphere in which God can get, we can get, draw close to God. If, if, if you're married and you don't spend any time with your spouse, you could be riding in the car together and feel like you're a million miles apart because you haven't cultivated a relationship. And it's the very same way with, with Jesus. If we don't develop that and cultivate that relationship with God, he could be right next to us and we feel like he's a million miles away. So the Christian life is a fight for an unrestrained intimacy. The Christian life is a fight for an unrestrained intimacy. Paul told Timothy in Timothy chapter 2, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So there is a big no, but it frees us up for a much better yes. Serving God, there is a big no. There's people that I don't hang out with anymore that I used to hang out with. There's places I used to go that I don't go anymore. There's, there's things that I used to do that I don't do anymore. And that is a big no, because maybe there's people that you used to hang out with that you were really good friends with, but they're not a good influence on your life. There's things that I don't do anymore. There is a big no, but it frees us up for a much better yes. We have an enemy who hates our king. If you're here today and you're serving the Lord we have an enemy who hates our king because we, if, you're living for, if you're living for the Lord and you're, you're earnestly seeking to, 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 to do what, what the Lord wants us to do, you're, you should look like the Lord. When someone treats you poorly, you should respond like the Lord. Whenever someone cuts you, you should bleed. What you sh- there's nothing that, that shouldn't resemble the Lord. I remember several years ago, I think I was 18, 19 years old, uh, my dad is here, and I got an interview where my dad wanted to work where my dad worked. And I got an interview there, and my dad's a good man. He, he was worked, and I may butcher exactly what he did, but I know he did work for the union and helping uh, facilitate their contracts and, and work out the, for the workers' rights, making sure that they got everything that they needed. And because of that, because he worked hard trying to make sure that the workers had what they needed, the company side didn't like him a whole lot, a lot of times. And I got into the interview, and they're like, oh, you're Rick Taylor's son. And because I look like my father, they knew who my father was, I didn't get the job. Because um, it, it, so Some of them didn't like him there um, because he, he'd worked hard for these workers. So if you're, if you're working hard to serve the Lord and you look like the Lord, you have an even bigger on, target on your back now. Because you're serving the one who shamed him. In Colossians chapter 2, the Bible says, He made a public spectacle of them and triumphing them over them by the cross. And so we're not immune to temptation as Christians. In fact, we probably are, are a bigger target because we look like our father who shamed him. And so we're going to talk about our strategy. But first, we're going to look at the enemy's strategy. And we're going to look at what he knows and what he does. And then we're going to look at what we do in response. So the enemy knows your wiring. The enemy knows your tendencies. He knows about what time you go to bed every night. He knows about what time you wake up. He knows what you eat for breakfast. He studies you. He's read the book on you. He's watched your documentary. The, the, the enemy's job is to make sure that he knows what he can tempt you with. He knows that you have likes. He knows you have dislikes. He knows that you have affections for certain things. And he also knows that you have a will. And the, the enemy wants us to use that will to willfully step away from intimacy with God. Why would we openly just step away from intimacy with God? We wouldn't do it openly, blatantly, and the enemy knows that. So he doesn't start tempting you with anything big, extravagant. He starts with little things here and there 
that just catching the eye. And what happens whenever our, our attention grabs it and we, we see it for long enough, our affections start to get stirred for it. And that's how um, ultimately our will can choose to, to sin against God. And so the Bible calls this act of the will sin when we act on it. And that moment that the enemy will put thoughts in your mind and stir the affections, the Bible calls that temptation. So James 1 and 14 says, But each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And you end up in a place that you were never meant to be. What you think about is what you care about. And what you care about, you will chase. I'll say that again. What you think about is what you care about. And what you care about, you will chase. So what do you entertain in your mind? What kind of thoughts do you allow to, to dwell in your mind? Because what, what you think about, you're going to care about. And what you care about, you're going to chase. And so what, are we, what kind of thoughts are we allowing to just dwell on in, in our minds? That, because what you think about, it will determine what you love and what you become. Good self-knowledge to have is how does the enemy come at me? If the enemy knows me as well as I know myself, how is the enemy going to come at me? We have to find that out and ask ourselves that question. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and 16, he says, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Paul said, Know you, Timothy. Know, know what makes you tempted. Know what, what kind of weaknesses that you have. Know Timothy really, really, really well. Because the enemy is going to come at you and know how he, is, how he does it. If the enemy comes at you, which he will, it shouldn't be a surprise that he brings whatever he brings at you because you have to know yourself, Paul says. In our text, James called it a lure. Anybody like to fish in here? I'm not a, I'm not a big fish, fisher, fisherman, I guess you'd call it. I don't even, Cole loves to fish, and he can tell me all these lures that he uses, and I couldn't tell you what one is over the other. I, just, I know when I put it in the water, I don't catch anything, so it gets a little bit. I don't really enjoy it as much as he does. Um, but Paul said, it, it, uh, James called it a lure, like a fish lure, to get the fish's attention. And once it gets your attention, its job is to stir your affections. And once your affections are stirred, it never even saw the hook coming. I had no idea that from the very beginning it was a setup. And the enemy will use different lures for me than it uses for you. And it'll, it'll, it, it, knows, it knows our temptations and knows our affections. Sun Tzu from the Art of War says this, If you know the enemy and know yourself... You need not fear the results of a hundred battles. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. So what, what do we do in response? Three things. Number one is we eliminate the moment. We eliminate the moment. Matthew 26 and 41 says that watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So we look upstream and we say, what got me into temptation to the first place? What was it that got me in to uh, struggle with this temptation? There's a guy that I used to work with that, um, not necessarily really a churchgoer, but he, he was struggling with um, alcohol. He had, he, and not necessarily that he was, uh, he started having some medical problems. And he was, he said, well, I play, if I play PlayStation, I, he goes, to play PlayStation. If he has PlayStation, then he has to drink a beer because it kind of goes together. He, he plays whatever the... Um, Call of Duty or whatever game that they, the, I, I, obviously I don't play games, but he was playing this video game and he, when, if he played the video game, he had to have a beer. And he said, man, I just, I'll have 10 or 12 beers sitting there playing that game for a few hours. I'm like, so that led to, so, so why, so first off, you're 40 years old. Why are you still playing a video game? Now, I, I, I probably just offended some video game players here, but I, I don't, I'm not a big gamer, but that, so that doesn't really speak to me, but that maybe it's, it's a temptation. So if video games lead to the alcohol problem. Maybe just eliminate the video games for a couple nights a week to start up and then, and then work your way back. I'm sorry, I know I fitted a couple back there in the back. <laughs> so maybe if, if that leads to the alcohol, maybe we just die it down a little bit. Maybe, maybe take away a couple game nights a week away and work your way up so that we can eliminate that alcohol problem. That's, if that's where it started. I had another guy at work that um, used to work with me, doesn't, doesn't anymore. He was a single guy. And he, and he was a churchgoer. He would say, man, I tell you, I'm, I've struggled with pornography for a long time, and I've not been able to get the battle over this thing. And it just had, had struggled with this for years. Uh, he said, I prayed about it, and I've just always ended up messing up. And so 
how does that struggle get you? And we talked it back, and he's like, well, you know, I go to bed at night, and, you know, right before I go to bed, I see my phone laying there beside the nightstand, and, and it just, that's all it took. And I was just, so if that's what it is, that would be like, like an alcoholic laying a glass of scotch by his nightstand and saying, I'm not going to drink it, I'm just going to sit it there. That's a, that's a terrible strategy. Romans chapter 13 says, make no provision for the flesh. So if that's going to be the, the temptation, get all the screens out of the bedroom. Like, don't, don't have anything in there. I've never fought a lion, but if I do, I want to fight a baby one. Attack sin when it's small, don't wait till it's fully grown. Attack sin when it's small and don't wait for it to be fully grown. Number two, we paddle downstream. So we turn our ear downstream and listen for the waterfall ahead and find out where is this road going to take me. James chapter 115. Desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The Greek would use gender-specific words. So that word desire was actually a feminine word in the Greek. And it meant to unite with, to conceive. So he's saying desire, when you unite with your desire, and sin was also a feminine word. And it said whenever you unite with your desire, it will conceive and bring forth sin, which is death. So you, it's a weird imagery, but you literally give birth to death whenever you unite with your desire. So temptation is tempting. It always sounds good. It always sounds, feels good. But if I start here, if I start right here, where is this road going to lead me? So we look downstream. Temptation leads to destruction. And last point, we paddle upstream. What is giving my temptation their, their energy? What is giving my temptation their, uh, their momentum? What, what is giving my, my temptation a foothold in my life? Why is this activity I know is destructive so alluring to me? For many of us who struggle with addiction, we want to forget maybe a memory or we want to just eliminate bad feelings and we just want to be separated from any sort of, of memory from, from maybe something that happened in the past or just a feeling. So what are we running from? What are we running from? So downstream from temptation is destruction. Upstream from temptation is deception. So what is the lie? James 1 and 16 says, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The lie that launches a million sins, and this is where we all, this is where it has to begin. The, the lie that launches a million sins is that God is not a good enough Father who will take care of me whenever I need Him. Because we, we, have, we don't have a proper understanding of the love of God. We don't really understand the love that our Father has for us. When I think about this, I'm like I, I, to say that I would die for my children is a, a vast understatement. Like I, there's nothing I wouldn't do for my children. And to try to wrap my mind around, God loves us so much more than I can even perceive that. I can even understand that. God loves us. And if we start with that, in, in James 1 and 18, it said, of his own will, he brought us forth. He knew you were going to struggle with what you struggle with. And of his own will, he brought us forth. I want us to stand. Philippians chapter 3, if you can. Philippians chapter 3 and 8 says, yes, and this is in the New Living Translation. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I would gain Christ. So we, we look at our battles and we look at our temptations and we're honest with ourselves. And we know ourselves and we know what we face and struggle. And we go into that battle knowing this, is that the Lord loves you more than you could even fathom. That God loves me more than I could ever love myself. That the, the love that God has for me supersedes anything that my mind can even comprehend. That at my worst moment in, in, in my life, at my worst sin, that Christ felt that sin on the cross. Christ became the guilty person. He didn't just take the rap for something that he didn't do. He became the guilty person. He didn't just die for the guilty person. He became the guilty person. So he felt the shame and the sin of what I've done. He's felt the shame and the sin of what you've done. At your worst moment of your life, Christ felt that. And he willingly gave his life so that we could, we could live. 
and not die for that. So we're going to pray for just a moment, and Frank's going to close us out. But I just want someone today to connect and understand that God's love for you is so stronger than, than what we could even imagine to perceive in our lives. So Lord, we love you today, God. And I just pray over every individual that's here today, God, that you would, Lord, develop an understanding in our hearts today, God. That you're just, just a, a little bit of an understanding of, Lord, just how much that you love us, God. And I pray that you will soften every heart, God, and, and shake us up and help us to understand shortcomings, God, and temptations that we struggle with that maybe we're blind to, that, that we might serve you, Lord, in, in a capacity, Lord, that you can use us and that you can, we ultimately want to be close to you, God. We want to cultivate an intimacy with you, God, that we uh, have not had before. We want to get closer to you every day. And I pray that whatever is restraining that intimacy, God, whatever is causing uh, distance and in that intimacy with you today, God, I pray that you would, Lord, lay it on our hearts, reveal it to us, Lord Jesus, so that we can, we can begin to fight that battle with an understanding that you love us more than we could ever love ourselves, God. And I thank you for victory that you've already won. God, I thank you for the victory that you've already purchased with your blood. And we lay claim to that today. And we thank you for that, Lord, and on your victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you there, Brother Derek, for sharing the power and the truth of God's word today. You know, we've heard that today. So in the next few moments, we're all going to then uh, uh, make a decision. Even if we don't do anything, we have, let's see, uh, made a decision. You know, as we've heard of the, the uh, love of God for us, maybe this is new to you. Maybe you haven't heard this before, but you were made to have a re uh, relationship with God. But sin messed that up. Our sin messed that up. But because of his compassion and love for us, he sent his one and only son. As we have already heard this morning, who died on the cross. All then for our sin and as our sin. If that's you, I'm going to invite you in just a moment just to come then uh, forward because I'd love to speak with you and to then, uh, pray with you and lead you to the, 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 the holy uh, throne of God. The uh, second thing is maybe the, the Lord is leading you to also become a part of this family of faith. We would love to have you and our arms are open. Uh, why? So those are the, the invitations today that we want to offer to you. This altar is open. If you want to come and pray, you can pray alone. Bring someone uh, with you if you like. Let's allow for the next few moments to God, for the, uh, the, the Lord to have his perfect will and way in us as we sing. us today. I see a, the, uh, a lot of faces here today. I see the faces here from our friend Sunday. I see faces here from our last Sunday, the backpack Sunday, the back to school Sunday. Isn't that great? God is so good. Let me say to uh, you folks and also to the, every person that is in this room, welcome home. Welcome home. You can always come here. That our hearts are open to you. 
see and our arms are open to you as well. We would love to have you to come and to walk with us for the end of life together. Let me share uh, one more thing with you. Uh, man, if you have not received a uh, yellow card yet, uh, we have had to switch uh, nights like on our uh, nacho night. So, uh, so please then uh, see me. Like I have these cards up at the front. Uh, uh, you can even grab the uh, uh, one if I get side <laughs> side then I track a little bit. Like I say, we are glad to have you. Let's just then pray and then you're dismissed. Father, it was so good to be in your house today. I'm reminded of the scripture. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You were here today, God, and you walk with us every day in our hearts. And we thank you. We thank you for the uh, word that we heard today, Lord. We thank you for the uh, worship we have experienced. We thank you for this uh, family of the faith here, Father, that we can lean on each other. We can walk arm in arm, Lord, as we serve you. Father, we ask a special blessing upon each person here today. I pray this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Before you leave, find somebody that you don't uh, know and just say hi to them. Thank you. That's what I always hear as I talk so fast. And oh I, I tried to slow down. But I can understand everything you said. So I try my best to slow down. Uh-oh. Coming through the speakers. Oh, yeah, I can.